Bob Catter's book begins with these words from Old Botany Bay by Dame Mary Gilmore. I am he who paved the way that you might walk at your ease today. I was the conscript sent to hell to make in the desert the living well. I bore the heat, I blazed the track, furrowed and bloody upon my back. I split the rock, I felled the tree, the nation was because of me. Now, Bob Catter, why did you choose those words? Presumably because Dame Mary Gilmore um, lived a lot of her life in Cloncurry, asked to be buried there. Um, no, I, I didn't know about what Cloncurry's my hometown. I didn't know she was buried there till after I'd written the book, actually. I had to go back and, and put it in. Um, <laughs> no, Barry, I, I read The Fatal Shore, you know, and, mm. and Hughes had read Hughes that poem, and I don't think anyone captured the convict era as well as those phrases. I was the convict in the version I had sent to hell to make in the desert the living well. I split the rock, I fell the tree, this nation was because of me. Um, I just, I thought it was very powerful stuff. But very interesting character, you know, where she was alleged to have had a notorious affair with Henry Lawson and maybe JT Lane as well, I, you know, really. And, and she went to Paraguay, you know, uh, I mean, and then ran the Worker newspaper, which is the most aggressive, radical paper, Australian Workers' Union paper. And, Queensland, uh, from which she wielded immense power. But it, it, it speaks of the convict past, and clearly that yep. captures your imagination, because before the cold rush, um, Australia was essentially a country with a population the size of Canberra, and then it just exploded. It seems to me that you argue that it was miners. Well, what are you saying? Was Australia then, were they really a nation of miners or a nation of convicts? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I'll be, I'm very specific in the book because I think it's important to know and understand this, that, yes, you're right, there are about 300,000 uh, Europeans, for the sake of a better word, but it was even then getting pretty mixed up, um, before Hargraves found gold. And then three and a half million people flocked to Australia. One person in 50, uh, Geoffrey Blaney uh, says in his book, one person in 50 in the British Isles came to Australia. And here they stayed. Um, but of those of us that were here before the Second World War, one in three of us have a convict or a first Australian in the family tree. And almost everyone else came here during the gold rush days. And that most certainly would be true of all my forebears. Now, a bit of background. Your father held uh, the seat of Kennedy before you for 24 years. Uh, before Bob went into federal politics, he was um, a state minister in Queensland, held, held four different ministries. Um, the electorate of Kennedy is not bigger than Texas, but it's about two times bigger than Victoria. That'd be right, wouldn't it? <laughs> I don't want to put the Victorians down. I <laughs> quality, mate. It's not I the size of the dog in the fight. Quality ball. here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but tell us about that then. The about how the um, where, how the catters came to settle in that area. There, there were you, you, you're right about the four original settlers. One of them being Kennedy. I presume that's the Kennedy that the seat was named after. Um, but where do the catters fit in? Um, <clears throat> yeah, on the catter side of my family, the other side of my family, they almost died in the Western Desert, West Australian Desert, chasing gold. Uh, and a cousin of mine is the Deputy Premier of Western Australia now. <coughs> um, but uh, my great-granddad uh, um, um, was selling clothes out of a covered wagon on the gold fields before there was a Charters Towers. We were there before the town existed. And uh, then um, became very wealthy and powerful. Uh, He's actually in the story, but I don't mention that he's a relative of mine. Um, but he gave £3,000 to the strike fund in 1894. He was a man who very strongly believed in what he believed in, and he believed the way the miners were being treated was disgusting. And he threw the full might and power of his wealth and position behind the miners uh, and the labour movement. Uh, of course, he clearly believed in it. But £3,000 in terms of today's money is about a million dollars. Now, all right, he was rich, but still, at the end of the day, he was a storekeeper in Charters Towers, hmm. which was about 50,000, 60,000 people. Hmm. That's all. 
Now, it's a, the book is called Incredible Race of People, so let's uh, talk about some of those people. And it surprised one critic who didn't seem to get it, and I was a bit surprised, that you'd spent, written so much on Ted Theodore. Now, to me, I, I would have thought any student of Australian political history knows that Ted Theodore is one of the giants. He was, um, he was <coughs> Treasurer and Deputy Leader in Queensland at 30 and Premier at 35. I mean, this guy was going places. Yeah, well, he... he <coughs> Mannix put him in charge of the conscription battle and uh, people like uh, John Curtin joined the Labor Party and became passionate followers of Theodore uh, as a result of the battle over conscription, which he built the hell out of Billy Hughes twice. Mm. And I think that Billy Hughes is one of the more shameful creatures that we have in Australian <laughs> history. Yeah. And, and I enjoyed him bashing him up no end. I, I, one of my, uh, my great-grandfather's brother died at Gallipoli, so I mean, obviously I feel pretty strongly about what happened in the First World War. Um, um, but Theodore, I mean, the dominant story of Australia was the battle to get a fair go, which came out of the Shearers. Um, but I think overwhelmingly more important, and maybe this is a Victorian and Queensland perspective, but we were the gold mining areas. New South Wales wasn't. We were the big gold mining areas. And <clears throat> that was where the population was in the gold fields. And Gympie, Maribor was bigger than Brisbane. Charters Towers was bigger than Brisbane. And similarly here, the great wealth of Victoria was in Ballarat and Bendigo. Um, <clears throat> um, so the Labor mo movement was born out of our pain. One in 31 of us that went down the mines never came back up again. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a horrific statistic. Mm -hmm. Or died of, most of them died of the terrible minus tysis. Um, but of the original leaders, uh, Charlie MacDonald was the member for Kennedy, my area, Charters Towers. Uh, he had minus tysis and had to leave politics. Um, the first Premier, Labor Premier in the world, uh, Anderson Dawson, had to retire from politics because he had minus tysis. The uh, second Labor Prime Minister of Australia, Fisher, his father died of minus tysis, and he also himself had to leave politics because of minus tysis. But there were no laws protecting us. The black people in Africa that went down the mines, they had laws protecting them from the dust. The poor people in Wales were like slaves and animals, they had steel collar in Wales, but they still had laws protecting them from minus tysis. We didn't. Now, that battle was led by Theodore. But he built our sugar mills, he built our grain silos, he built our railways, he built our dams, he built our ports. Um, <clears throat> and he fought the battle to get us a fair go, and he did that. And he built a hell out of Billy Hughes over conscription. And then, like all great epitaphs, if we, as a nation, had listened to him, at the start of the Depression, we'd have had no depression in Australia. But the, but the thing, <clears throat> he moved to Canberra, became Treasurer, and within 12 days, the New York stock market collapsed. His timing wasn't great. But, but the towering intellect of the men, I mean, where Malcolm Fraser and Paul Keating, both, said, both of them said of their two heroes, Theodore was one of those two heroes for both those uh, men. And I've got a picture of Theodore and McEwen sitting on my wall at Parliament House. But <clears throat> um, the reason for that, I think, overwhelmingly is actually because of his towering intellect. Um, I asked Manning Clark, was Theodore as clever as the history books make him out to be? And he said, I asked that the clerk of parliament sat there for 50 years listening to people in the parliament talk. And he didn't have to think. He just said, well, the most, the most brilliant speech I've heard in this place was the second reading <clears throat> bill, uh, speech to the uh, fiduciary notes issue bill. But if that bill would have been passed, we'd have never had a depression in Australia. Takahashi did it in Japan, no depression in Japan. Shark did it in Germany, no depression in Germany. Um, John Maynard Keynes did it in Britain, no depression in Britain. And Galbraith and the New Deal economists did it very late in America, and they worked their way out of the depression, but we were still in the depression when the war hit us. Mm. And, um, but those great men, Shifley and Curtin, acolytes of Theodore, um, <clears throat> they, all three of them sacrificed their political lives to try and rescue this nation. And it was, it was a very great thing that he did for us, Theodore. One of the other more extraordinary things he did when he was in Queensland was abolish the upper house. Now, how did he get away with that? How did he, how did he 
and organise his mates to vote themselves out of a job. The historian Humphrey McQueen, the social commentator, Humphrey always said nothing changes in Queensland because for Johnny Peterson there was a lot of bush ranger tactics with Albert Field and yeah. it was very much the same with Theodore. And if you looked at their policies, you know, they're, they're absolutely identical, right down to the fact that they could play some real, real bush ranger politics. Mm. I mean, they didn't play by the rules at all, <laughs> either of them. You know, um, they're pretty brutal people. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and he just cold-bloodedly appointed uh, 22 people to the upper house to vote themselves out of office. But, I mean, Theodore and McCormack, his sort of partner, they were big, powerful, physical men. And, um, and to quote the historian um, Ross Fitzgerald, he said, you had a choice. You know, it was a free country. You could take a union ticket or you could take a hiding. <laughs> that was a choice you were given. So when those 22 men went to the upper house, I mean, there was no doubt they were going to vote themselves out of office or Theodore would have got them and fixed them. Now, J.T. Lang tried to be a bit civilised, believe it or not. So he put some gentlemen into the upper house. And when they got in there, they decided, well, it wasn't such a good idea to abolish the, the upper house. So right. poor old JT, he got abolished, you know, <laughs> by, by the upper house. Yeah. And I regret to say one of them was a great uncle of mine, one of the naughty boys. Um, you, you mentioned <coughs> that uh, Chifley and, and Curtin took a hit in uh, 32. I, I get the impression that you were... You're, you're a bigger rap for Chifley than you were for Curtin? I, I think Chifley, uh, I say it in the book, he was the Prime Minister without peer. There's no Prime Minister even gets close to him. He gave us the telephone system in Australia, which is a very similar decision to the NBN, I might add. Um, a very hard decision to take. Um, he gave us the Snowy Mountains. Um, he abolished tuberculosis in a very brutal, ruthless campaign. I mean, it was very, very terrible what they did. But they did it, and we got rid of tuberculosis, which was the scourge of this country uh, at the time. He built 26,000 houses in this country after the war. We never had a post-war depression like <coughs> other countries did. <coughs> I mean, he just was the prime minister without peer. No one could even go close to him. Mm. And, of course, he gave us the Holden motor car. Yeah. as well. And Curtin, on the other hand, uh, you were critical of uh, some of the decisions that were taken during the war. I like your focus, though, on, on World War II, and it was about Darwin, which is sometimes lost in all of this, and, and it brought home how vulnerable Darwin was, and how close, really, that Australia came from uh, losing the North. Well, I, I, you know, I had some unique perspectives, obviously. My family were there, involved in the battle in the Labor movement, and it centred around places like Charters Tower, so, I mean, I, I knew the history. It was handed down to me. But in the Second World War, it was the 49th Battalion, was one of the three militia battalions that was sent up. Now, my father served in that battalion. Um, he didn't go to Kokoda, but he served in that battalion. My, his cousin served in that battalion, and I served in that battalion, and I was the unit historian. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when I discovered that my battalion had been said to be a fallback battalion and had basically been called cowards and when I found out that one in three of my battalion had stayed in their positions and died for their country and two-thirds of them had either died or been wounded and crippled for life, this is how great these men were and they rescued this country from Japanese invasion. I mean you can feel, I hope you can feel the rage in that, my book, that, that the way the Kokoda, 49th right? Battalion it, was treated. And Kokoda was the key to it. They, they decided Absolutely. to make the stand there to Absolutely. protect Port Moresby. And, yeah. and they lost every... The 39th Battalion was the main one, but the 49th was one of the other three battalions. <clears throat> the 39th lost every single battle. The Australians lost every battle from Kokoda back to Port Moresby. They lost every battle. But they lost it in a way that they made the Japanese pay such a price for winning every one of those battles... By the time the Japanese got to within sight of Port Moresby, there was nothing left of them. They were just a heap of skeletons, you know, with nothing, uh, floating on nothing. And uh, we destroyed and stopped, for the first time, the Japanese in 800 years of land warfare. They'd beaten the Americans, outnumbered two to one, the Japanese were. They belted out the Americans, took the Philippines. Churchill said the worst defeat England had ever suffered in its entire history was the fall of Singapore. Again, the Japanese were outnumbered two to one. Um, they won 12 of the 
the uh, 12 out of 12 naval battles, and, uh, and then they ran into us at Millen Bay and Kokoda, and they'd run into a tough race of people, an incredible race of people that mm. uh, were so tough, they knew how to fight, they knew how not to give in, and, uh, and they were fighting for their country mm. and to stop it from invasion. Now we'll, go, we'll go back to politics now, and, uh, and you're right about um, a, a meeting that you went to, an ALP meeting, when you were a kid. I think you were about 10 years old. Tell us about that. Um, I, I, I remember it vividly. I remember it just like it was yesterday. And I went with my father. I used to go everywhere with my father um, <clears throat> in those days. And um, I went along to the local ALP meeting. It was the ALP secretary of the branch. And I don't want to make out that we were poor working class people. We weren't. We were very well off people. But uh, we went along to the meeting, and he was secretary of the branch. <clears throat> and I said, what's going to happen today, Dad? Because I knew all about the split. Everyone in Queensland did. Even if you're a kid, you knew about it. There were fights in the playground uh, at school about it. Um, and he said, he said um, well, you know, we've got to stick. Whatever we do, we've we got to stick. And old Paddy Cook, he was an old shearer. Uh, he was about 72 at the time, Paddy, and he had braces. And he stood up and he said, this is the worst day of my life. This is the worst day of my life. And he didn't cry, because Cloncurry boys don't cry. But big tears were rolling down his face. And he said, I think we've got to stick. And I think stick means sticking to the government, the people that we elected to parliament, not faceless men. Uh, so I think stick means sticking with gear. So the branch, my father stood up and he said, well, you know, whatever we decide today, we've all got to stick and I'm going with Paddy, I believe we've got a stick, um, so I'm going with Paddy. And then each of them got up and said the same thing, and it was the unanimous decision of the branch to go with Gare. Um, and um, I said in the book that Paddy Cook died two years later. They said he died of a broken heart because his beloved Labor Party, who he'd fought for all of his life and believed in, was destroyed. And that little boy's father, um, something in him broke. He was never quite the same person again. Um, <clears throat> his belief in, you know, doing the right thing, it took a big hit and he was never quite the same person again. And, and as the book reads, I know these things to be true because that town was Cloncurry mm. and I was that little boy. Why then did the Catters eventually stop sticking with Labor? What we, happened? Well, we, I, I mean, you know, I, I suppose, you know, my family and I don't the book's not about my family. It really has nothing to do with my family. But we're very tribal. And, you know, we went with the tribe. Um, you know, the tribe uh, was Labor, and we were always Labor. Um, whether we were leading the tribe or whether we were led by the tribe, I don't know. Uh, but we were always in step with the tribe. And then the tribe <clears throat> went to the QRP, um, and then the QRP collapsed and ceased to exist completely. So we had no home then, and um, like the rest of North Queensland and Western Queensland, um, we decided to join the Country Party. Um, so that was where we stayed, and we asserted a different sort of principle, that we're country people and we weren't getting a fair shake, and we needed a fair shake. And people like McEwen appealed to every, everything about us. McEwen uh, appealed to us very greatly. Um, so that was where we shifted, and that was where we ended up. It was McEwen to, to begin with, um, but then, of course, Bjelke Peterson. And it just seems a long journey to some of us to go from Theodore, Curtin, Chifley, and then Joe Bjelke Peterson. Well, you see, Humphrey McQueen's statement that nothing changes in Queensland, you would have had your legs broken if you're in the country party in Queensland. And you suggested that we deregulated an industry or that we sold an asset. Oh no, we own, we the people of Queensland own these assets. You heard, we're not selling them to any big corporation. I mean, we own these assets. And you know, that was the same in the Labor Party, same in the Country Party. I mean, Joe did, I mean, where there was a difference was Joe did a lot of huffing and puffing about the unions and he was going to bash them up and he was going to do this and do that. But he never did anything at all, except in the area of emergency services. And really, and I'm not trying to denigrate Joe, because you know he founded the coal industry. We're very development-oriented. 
Theodore's very development, that developmentalism was inherent in the DNA of the country party, was inherent in the DNA of the Labor Party. But it has not been in the Labor Party or the National Party for the last 30 years now. Mm. They're the complete opposite. But this developmentalism that we'll build a railway so we can get the coal out, so we can create these jobs and be a big wealthy state and have prosperity for all of our people. No, we'll have <clears throat> an arbitrated price for sugar. You big sugar milling company, Colonial Sugar Refining Company, you won't be telling us what you'll pay us for our sugar. We'll be telling you what you'll pay us for our sugar. So, I, I mean, really, if you read the book, you can see clearly that there was no change in the policies whatsoever. But where I personally came badly unstuck is suddenly I find myself in a party that hasn't, won't spend a cent on any infrastructure or develop anything. They give us a lecture about how the free market will develop it all for you. you know? and, uh, and if we have a free market, that'll be wonderful for everyone. I never believed in a free market. I believe in an arbitrated price for the worker. And I believe in an arbitrated price for the farmer. But and so I, I mean, I was completely at sea. I, you know. But Joe Bioki Peterson and his mate Russins, they, they were bits of rogues. Were there times when you had to look the other way? <laughs> no. No, Bjorki Peterson, and I don't know whether a lot of the book you know, was cut down or was cut in half because it was just too long. <laughs> but I don't know whether they cut this bit out. But Bjorki Peterson was accused of being a crook and uh, being corrupt. And my last visit to Joe before he died, Second last I visited him when he, he was dying. But my second last visit to him, it was a stinking hot day, Barry. And I had to walk from the car up to the house, which is a bit of a walk up, you know, to the house of Bethany. And it's a tiny little cottage, really, you know, not much bigger than a housing commission house. Nice little house, but just brick house. And there's no air conditioning, and I'm soaking wet. And um, Florence brought a, an old fan in and put the fan up for us. And, um, but when we finished, Flo said, could you carry him, uh, help me get him back to bed? And, well, I had to carry him, so I, I carried him back to bed. And I said, well, Florence, hold on a minute. Florence was 80, 80 I think, 80 years of age at the time, uh, or late 70s. Um, I said, but well, what's say I'm not here? I mean, how would you have got him? Oh, Bob, I managed. We have a person come in twice a week for an hour and a half, but we manage. But that stone motherless broke, Barry. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the same time, and I'm not having to go up Paul Keating, but at the same time, in the front of the Sydney Morning Herald, it said how he had three houses worth five and a half million dollars. This is back in 1993 or 94 or five, whatever the hell it was. And, uh, <clears throat> and he had uh, shares in one company alone were worth eight and a half million dollars. I mean, um, there's a comparison between the two men. Now, I'm not saying that Keating was corrupt or anything like that. But I'm just saying, well, you know, how come this place broke? He was getting so much. No, Joe wouldn't take a free cup of water. I mean, Russo, I mean, quite frankly, did. Mm. And, but Russo is a hero in my book. It's really strange. And I mean, I thought a lot about putting him in. But, you know, I, when you add up the good things and bad things that a person does in his life, People loved Russo. Two and a half thousand people went to his funeral. And I was there when 42,000 people at the opening of Sanctuary Cove, that Frank Sinatra and Whitney Houston and, and Alan, you know, the Australian singer, 42,000 people. And when Mike Gore thanked our local member of parliament, and Russ had already been charged with corruption, 42,000 people rose to their feet and gave him a rolling standing ovation because they knew this bloke would bleed for him would bleed from. And yes, he had been a naughty boy and he deserved to have his backside kicked. There was no doubt about that, let me tell you. you know, but, but you know, you've got to add up the good things and bad things. And anyway, that's for God to decide, not me. And then, uh, so they were the giants, now the little, little Pusians, if you call them. <laughs> um, I guess Billy McMahon was one of them? Yeah, I, I mean, the giants, Barry, I, you know, I mean, less these, I just, you know, what a towering figure. The Geelong Melbourne Highway was built by the Thies brothers. You get a tenth of your electricity from the Snowy Mountains, peak electricity from the Snowy Mountains. That was built by Thies brothers. They built all, all the foreign corporations. They beat them in tendering. They, he built the Gold Coast. But the coal industry of Australia that has carried this nation for the last 
35 years now, economically, the coal industry. Les Thies created that industry. Now, he wouldn't have got there without Jockey Peterson, but it was Les that did it. And here's a kid that went left school at fourth grade. Every morning before he went to school might have been one of the reasons he left a fourth grade march. Because they had to milk five cows before they walked six kilometres, whatever it was, to school, barefoot. And then when they come home at night, they'd have to milk five cows. The, le the 11 these children had yeah. to do that. And, and this is a bloke that he, he just, everything in this, this country is built so much by Les Thies. What an extraordinary yeah. character. So that's walking with giants, you know. Yep. Les Thies, Lawrence Hartnett, who created the Australian motor car, um, the people that built the Snowy Mountains, the actual workers that built the Snowy Mountains. Um, and then you get on to the pygmies. Yep. The rise of the <laughs> Lilliputians. And, so who, and who's uppermost among them? The curtains pull back and we see Billy McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I mean, I really thought that I had that dead right. You know, you, you pinpoint a point at which we switch from walking with giants to Lilliputians. But, I mean, there's a great story in there, and I, I never... I, every time I think of it, I, I, I have to laugh, but, I mean... Jim Killen hated Billy McMahon. They were both in the same party, of course. But Billy McMahon got up as Prime Minister. This is in the Parliament of Australia. And his little squeaky, effeminate voice, he says, Oh, sometimes I think that I am my own worst enemy. And Killen yells out, No, well, I'm in this place, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we went, we went through the Whitlam years and then... Uh, and, and you, you, you're critical of most of the, the Keating Howard reforms. Um, you don't really see them as economic reforms um, oh. towards free markets. You saw what you saw was the disintegration of agricultural manufacturing industries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, when you say I was critical of them, that would be mild understatement. I hope that you, you feel the rage, and hatred, and violence of my uh, reaction to those policies. Uh, but. Like most Australians, to some degree, I've ceased to read the newspapers. We read today that the economy is doing marvellously well. All I know is I met three people uh, that morning before I picked up the newspaper. One of them had just lost her job. Uh, you know, I mean, in so the real what, world... what are you suggesting? Yeah, Unemployment's at 33% because <coughs> one of the three people you met is without a job. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, the, uh, there has been... A poll done. Um, Channel 9 did it, I think. Uh, but it was done by uh, AC Nielsen or one of the pollsters and uh, had the real figure for unemployment three times what it's alleged to be. But I can, we don't want to waste time tonight boring you, but um, the figures are doctored up to a point where they're quite ridiculous. And uh, the figures for the GDP are also doctored up, they're quite ridiculous. And when they say two speed economy in Australia, that's a lie. That is a lie. There is a two-town economy. On the east coast of Australia, there is Gladstone and Mackay going through the roof, and the rest of us are rapidly moving towards Struggle Street. Um, in Western Australia, there's a two-town economy. Carrather and Port Hedland going through the roof, and the rest of Australia is doing it immeasurably hard. Um, and, well, if this manufacturing's collapsing, tourism's gone, and... Uh, and, and agriculture is absolutely doomed. Within three and a half, three years, we'll be a net importer of food in this country. And it'll get much worse from there. But how can you say that tourism is gone, for example? Because I mean, I the numbers don't suggest that yeah. at all. Well, let me just tell you, I represent Cairns. Right? Now, the value of land there, uh, at the, on the Gold Coast, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, you can check it out, uh, she said that land values in the Gold Coast have dropped over 30%. And it is the worst period of depression that the Gold Coast has ever seen. She's on record as saying that you bring her up and ask her if you don't believe me. I represent the bottom of Cairns, and uh, we're 23 cafes on the Esplanade there, open at half past two in the morning. Now we've only got three open at midnight. I, uh, <clears throat> um, our fall in land values has been worse than the Gold Coast. Well, they're going somewhere, they're the because, but the numbers are as good now as they were 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> the numbers of overseas know, visitors. I, I can't argue, Barry, with you on the technical numbers. I can in manufacturing. You know, we've gone from 82% Australian vehicles down probably this year to 12%. It was, 14, uh, it was 21% uh, last year. 
and I think it'll probably be 12 per cent this year. I can argue manufacturing figures with you. I can argue agricultural figures with you. Um, but on tourism figures, um, that would be very hard, Barry, to argue. Very, very hard indeed. Um, but I would put on the table the evidence. And, and I mean, I, do I have to put it on the table? I mean, obviously, if the dollar has doubled in value, when Costello in his second year there, it was 52 cents. I mean, it's now 100 cents. I mean, well, it's doubled the price to have a holiday in Australia, and the price to go to Bali is halved. Mm. And yet, despite all that, as, as I said, the, um, um, the overseas numbers were, were published just a couple of days ago, and though the British uh, tourists are down, the Chinese and Japanese are up in big numbers. They're up about 36% over the last five years. Um, <clears throat> Barry, you and I will have to disagree, and I'll come back to you because I'll do the research on those figures, <laughs> and I'll bet London to a brick on that it's the... Uh, you know, the uh, Tourism Bureau in Cairns and Gold Coast saying, oh, look, it's really picking up, it's really going <laughs> terrific, you know. And, um, but Dr Kemp did the figures proving how the ALP was cheating on the unemployment figures. And it was quite brilliant what he did, actually. And he got really very firm grip on how Keating was cheating on the unemployment numbers. And he became a master at it when he became Minister for Employment. You know, he exercised all of the great knowledge that he had on doctoring up the unemployment figures. But I'll just give you one figure. Uh, if, you, if you work for two hours in a fortnight, you're registered as employed, not un unemployed. Now, um, look, I know that these issues come up all the time with you. Sexism, racism, homophobia, you name it. I don't know how racism is ever raised with you, given your background. It's just ridiculous. Um, on sexism, now, it came up once when the Mayor of Mount Isa suggested that um, beauty challenged women, as he called them, um, ought to go to Mount Isa where there's a shortage. And you said... <laughs> That's screamingly funny, and you copped a bit of a shellacking for it. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have backed the mongrel because he has an Akubra hat named after him, and I don't. <laughs> Every time he sees me, you still haven't made it, mate, he says to me. Um, but, but, I mean, it was quite brilliant and clever. Um, there's actually a statistic that indicates the number of women in Mount Isa is picked up. Seven and a half percent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it was, um, as a young bloke in Mount Isa, where there were three thousand single men in the barracks there, Barry, and there were only three women not spoken for in the town. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, I, I deeply appreciated his comments, <laughs> casting myself back to the days of my youth in Mount Isa when I was working there as a labourer. And the media went crazy on it. It was great publicity for Mount Isa for about a week. Well, it, we got the message to the whole of Australia that, you know, it was a place to go if you, you know, you were a girl. Um, so I thought it was brilliant and clever. But, but, you know, look, I mean, when we lose our sense of humour, I, mean, I, I truly thought it was screamingly funny. And, <laughs> and there are many occasions where I found things extremely funny and probably got into trouble <laughs> for insensitivity in the media. And probably you will in the future. so too. <laughs> I want to ask you some questions now about contemporary politics uh, before we Barry, take... Barry, go back to the racism thing, though. Yep. Um, you know, it would be true to say that there is a huge bias uh, in our party, the KP, towards the First Australians. I think six of our candidates were First Australians. There are another, I think, ten people that were married to First Australians. Um, our third or fourth policy was title deeds for First Australians. I mean, to a very large degree, most of the community areas had our signs up. They saw it as their party for the first time. They really had a party that was coming from their side of the thing. And um, oh, I'm not exactly white and I come from Corn Curry. Mm. So, you know, we call ourselves the Curry Mob. And I'm very, very proud of that. Um, but, uh, you know, we can be fiercely aggressive as the Kalkadoon Mob, the mob from my my hometown, were. They held white settlement at bay for nearly 70 years. And I conclude that chapter by saying, ferocious and feared, yes, but patriots and heroes on a grand scale. And, and I was very proud in the last election campaign in Queensland to be able to lead a party that those people felt was their party. Hmm. Well, we'll be taking some questions from the floor shortly, but I want to ask you, um, Julia Gillard, do you think she will go the distance? Um, you know, Barry, I've always liked and got on well with Julia personally. You know, she's got 
good sense of humour and she doesn't take herself too seriously. But, I mean, Jack McEwen used to say, and it's interesting, Barry's, Jack McEwen was chairman at Barry's parents' wedding. Small world we live in. One of my, I sit under his picture in my, my office at Parliament House. He's a great inspiration to me, Jack McEwen. But Jack McEwen said, the most important thing in government is to get it right. And an education is no replacement for hard work in getting it right. And I, mean, I can see the decisions, uh, particularly with he and Bajocki Peterson, that they had to take. And they're terribly tough decisions to make. I mean, to start talking up trade with Japan in 1959, I mean, you know, I say in the book, you know, my uncle bought a Japanese car and my father would have killed him if he'd got hold mm. of me. You know, and this was in 1960, I think, yep. that he bought the whole, you yep. know, the Japanese car. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it was, we had to do it for survival. But the brave men that had to take that decision, I'm pleased Barry it was then that had to make that decision because I don't think I'd have had the courage to do it. Jack McEwen said, I took full responsibility for it, but I didn't have much competition. <laughs> no one else was stepping forward. Well, can I lead you back to Julie Gillard? I guess yep. that's a long way around of saying um, <laughs> that she's no Jack McEwen, but uh, is she going to make it? Well, I mean, to me, uh, much as I like her personally, Julie just does not put the time in to get the outcome right. And, uh, you know, on an issue like carbon tax, I mean, John Howard said he announced the carbon tax, he and Malcolm Turnbull. Um, they decided for it. And then uh, Kevin Rudd, and, you know, good friends with Kevin, got a lot of respect for Kevin, but it took a bloody lot of courage for him to reverse that decision because when he did his homework, he found out there's just no way that you could proceed down this pathway. And then he had the courage to do 180 degrees, which you know, may have cost him his leadership. Um, but to me, and I might be flattering him a little bit too much here, uh, to me, um, he did the homework, and sadly for him, he'd done it after he'd made the decision mm -hmm. and realised he was wrong and had the courage to admit that he was wrong. But <clears throat> that's a decision that will put the electricity prices, we already have the most unaffordable electricity in the world, but it'll put them up to a level where we just will not be able to compete in any mineral processing. And all of our big companies have announced that they're doing no more mineral processing in Australia. So we're not a mining country. A mining country sells metal, right? Digs it out of the ground, sells metal. We're not a mining company. We dig it out of the ground, sell the ground. That's a quarrying company country. Mm -hmm. we, we quarry. We have an iron ore quarry and a coal quarry. We don't have a, a mining uh, country anymore. And one of the reasons for that is the high cost of electricity. Well, high as it is, it's going to go one hell of a lot higher. And there are a lot of pensioners, people on fixed incomes, they're finding it difficult I'm, to make ends meet. I'm not sure where this is going to go, but do you I'm think sorry. Julie Gillard will make the distance? <laughs> um, you probably could infer from my answers that... <laughs> No, but, I'm but dodging the question. Clearly you think Kevin Rudd would be a better... Let me give you an look. Honest, honest answer, which you know, politicians never do, including this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that I don't know. Right. Um, that is a question but, that I simply don't know. If you'd have told me they'd left Anna Bly in the saddle in Queensland, I would have thought you were quite mad. I mean, clearly mm. they're going to get annihilated. And uh, they proceeded to do that. I mean, something had to be done about Gough Whitlam, you know, because they're going to get annihilated. I mean, whether you thought he was good or bad, the political realities were. I mean, we had a situation in Queensland where Mike Ohm, we were down to 12%. I mean, whether you thought he was good or whether he was bad, you know, when I mean, there was political reality, we were on 12%. I mean, we dealt with the political reality and we, so we only got beaten by six seats in that election. Tony Abbott, what kind of person is he and uh, what kind of Prime Minister would he make? I, Barry, I don't feel comfortable, you know, saying anything negative about people. I, I, no, I've never been... A, a person that... I wasn't inviting you to say anything negative about him. people um, <laughs> negatively. And, um, uh, and I'm not answering you. Maybe I am. <laughs> um, no, 
No, look, Tony's a different sort of person than, uh, than I am. Um, and, um, and I respect that he has very strong convictions. And, uh, and I think anyone that has strong convictions about something will stand his ground. You have to respect him even if you disagree with those convictions. And mm. I think that uh, that's a positive thing that I'm saying about him. Um, <laughs> Rob Oakshaw. I, I can't understand Rob. I just simply have no understanding of um, where Rob Oakeshott comes from at all. And uh, Tony Windsor would be one of the finest members of parliament I've ever served with. He'd be up mm. there with Peter Andron as a man that followed his conscience and his intellect uh, throughout his entire life. And in the last election, I don't know, he's just gone on a different path. And some people might say it's the right path, but uh, I've got to say publicly that in my opinion, it's not the right path. And in, not in the sense that he backs Labor all the time, but in the sense that Tony voted, you, it was very easy for me to predict what he was going to do, because if you worked out what you thought was the right thing to do, politics was irrelevant, and you picked out what was the right thing to do, then Tony would, would end up doing that, even though it cost him politically and his electorate. And I saw him do that on many occasions. Uh, like Peter Andrew, and they showed a, a terrific amount of intellectual hmm. integrity and courage. Yep. And, and I, just, I just haven't seen that sort of performance from Tony. And I've seen some great tragedies in politics. And, uh, and I hope that something happens and Tony goes back to where he was. But I've got to be honest and say that um, that's not the Tony in the last 12 months that I'd seen in all those years before that. And uh, Barry, you know, we. We, the three of us, were responsible for that Snowy Mountains decision to sell it, then put back into the parliament, and everyone got scared, and we won it. I mean, it was quite an extraordinary win that we had. But Tony was the sort of bloke that you could count on him to be there with you in that battle. But, you know, I wouldn't like for the Snowy Mountains sale to be put up again now. Mm. Andrew Wilkie. A Andrew is a bloke that follows his conscience, you know, what he sees is the right thing. Um, and he really does. Now, I mean, a lot of, you know, what he thinks is the right thing is a lot different than what I, I think is the right thing. Um, you know, we, we have to have our differences on gambling and other issues. But, uh, but Andrew is a bloke that most certainly has got my respect as a person that votes his conscience. Mm. Now, there's another important uh, reference in your book that I want to return to uh, at the end. But in the meantime, uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, there are a couple of ushers going up and down with microphones. Just let them know that you've... Here we go. Uh, yes, Bob. Um, the uh, Geller government says that it takes the climate science uh, seriously. And aside of the uh, merits and demerits of the carbon price mechanism, uh, Australia is the leading exporter of coal uh, in the world and thereby is exporting many of its uh, emissions. Uh, do you think there is a kind of inconsistency operating there? And if so, why? Or if so, why not? Please, please understand that in three years' time, our country will be a net importer of food. You can use a different set of figures and you'll come up with eight years. Now, whether it's three years or eight years, your country won't be able to feed itself. Now, we can't make a motor car. Well, again, if you want to draw the graph, I think it'll be 12% this year, 127 uh, is the projected figure for motor car production in Australia. It was 82% before Keating started the stupid policies off. So manufacturing, we can't make electric motor, we can't make a tyre in this country. Um, what can we make? Um, we can't make anything. We're not a manufacturing country anymore. Um, we are third world technology. We we've lost, we're losing and have lost the technology. We don't mineral process anymore. We've got no technology there. Um, all you've got is a tremendously successful iron ore quarry and a tremendously successful coal quarry. And they were built by Charles Court and the jockey Peterson, were the people that built that huge giant infrastructure that has given you this juggernaut, which we're all, I could use the word bludging, but that we're all making our living off at the present moment. But that's the narrowest, and I, I come from mining background, I'm, I'm not from a cattle or farming background, I'm a mining, miner all my life. And, uh, and I can tell you, it's the most cyclical of industries, mining. It goes up, it goes down. And, and may the good Lord help us when it comes down. 
because we've only got those two things going for us. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to your question about carbon, um, well, I mean, <clears throat> the problem in the world, as far as carbon dioxide goes, if you think it is a problem, is coal. That's what the problem is. And so if we decide, as our Prime Minister has decided, that uh, we've got to uh, stop carbon emissions, then you close down the coal industry and the country who will be bankrupted first will be Australia. I mean, it's a very good question that you ask and it is really scary. And if you see the people losing confidence in the Prime Minister, you know, there's a lot of people like yourself who've sat down and thought about this. The front here. Mr Catter, are you homophobic? <laughs> I can't spell that word. <laughs> no, look, I've never raised this issue to my knowledge in my life. I'm not interested in talking about it one way or the other. And, you, you, uh, did you, once. Me... you did once. Well, you I you mean... did say that you, if there were any homosexuals in your electorate, you would walk backwards to Burke. You know, I, I, there's a second part of that, which was extremely humorous, and John Laws ran it three mornings in a row. But what I say in here, you know, I mean, surely we can crack jokes in this country, but maybe we can't anymore. Maybe the thought police are sitting on our shoulders all of the time, you know. But look, Barry, I'm not answering, I'm sorry, no disrespect to you, sir, but I, I'm not the sort of person to talk about it one way or the other. I've never raised the issue in Parliament, uh, I've never raised the issue outside of Parliament except to crack a couple of jokes on two occasions, and, um, um, and, and that's where I, I leave the talk about it. It's just not something that I want to talk about. Okay. One way or the other. Down the back. Uh, G'day, Bob. Uh, thanks for the book. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, one of the things that struck me about it, though, was in your discussion about Bill McCormack, Theodore, and blokes like Russell Hins and Bjorki Peterson, the corruption scandals across the broad that brought them all undone, the Mangana affair for Theodore and McCormack and then the Fitzgerald inquiry, barely rate a mention in your book. You give them about two or three paragraphs. I was just wondering why you made that decision to give a more unvarnished portrait of your, of your historical heroes and not deal with the things that brought them undone. The, I actually put Russell Hins in because I wanted to make a point. I wanted to make a point that yes, you know, people are not perfect. They're not angels. They carry flaws. And um, because of those flaws, we don't take them out and burn them at the stake. And I've always had a great horror of the Spanish Inquisition or McCarthy era or, you know, I mean, those sort of people like Oliver Cromwell. And uh, as Winston Churchill said, Oliver Cromwell, the most hated man in all of English history. You weren't allowed to celebrate Christmas. The roundheads would get on their horses and take the plum puddings off the tables. You know, and I mean, I mean, that wows of you know, we will regulate this and we'll stop you from doing that. I've always hated that. And Hens is in there because he did a lot of fantastically good things. And, and, but I want to put in that these people are not angels. And, uh, um, but if you want to go into technicalities, the Mangana scandal, that there was totally innocent. His political opponents never, ever took him to trial because they knew if they did, they would be annihilated in the trial. And he demanded that they put him on trial again and again and again. But the only way they could ever get close to him was stabbing him in the back with dirty pieces of filthy rubbish. Now, as for Jockey Peterson, I actually put that in the book. The book was 1,050 pages long <laughs> and it had to be cut back to 450 pages. Um, but I'll just answer you quickly, my friend. I'll just answer you quickly, my friend. I just told you that this bloke, who was supposed to be corrupt, had a little tiny brick house and he didn't even have air conditioning in it. He had a fan carted from room to room and he had to be lifted by a visitor, you know, into his room and his 79 or 80 year old wife had to carry him around. That's what they were reduced to. Now, if he had corruption, where was the money? And there are other people uh, Prime Ministers of Australia that left with a hell of a lot of money. Now I'm not accusing them of corruption, but I don't think you've got the right to accuse somebody of corruption when he left without two bob to his name. Now I can tell you that what he was charged with, he was on the exact opposite side of the fence. And I was one of the blokes that did the numbers to roll him over the issue of the issue that he was charged with was using his uh, corrupt influence to look after a bloke who wanted the, uh, the Port Authority building in, um, in, in the centre of Brisbane. 
right? And I was on the other side of the fence, so was Bill Gunn, the Deputy Premier, so was Lynn Powell, the Minister for Education, so was Vince Lester. And we <clears throat> bushwhacked him, right? But he was on the side of Kern Corporation and he was accused of being on the side of the Regency bit. And he was on, always on the side of Kern Corporation. So, I mean, the charges against him were utterly outrageous. Utterly outrageous. And it was just once again the pygmies, the pygmies with their spears, poison spears, hitting somebody in the back who was too big for him ever to take head on. The same with Theodore and the same with this bloke. Right? But the, the question, but Hensie the, was different. But I mean, I, I, Bob, I'm the question did they go yeah. to the Fitzgerald inquiry and that did turn up some corruption among his ministers? No, no, it didn't. The four ministers that were found guilty were found guilty of misuse or excessively using or misusing, whatever words you choose, of their ministerial allowance. The leading case was Brian Austin, and he went to jail because he drove in his ministerial car up to see his kids at Armadale, who are in school at Armadale, one weekend. This is all a matter of public record. But when the, when the burning, when they start burning the witches, watch out, leave town. Because when they start that, that, that terrible burning uh, and, and furious feeding frenzy, Watch out. Because are, are they doing that again now? Everybody. Are they doing that again now in the federal parliament? Well, with Craig I mean, Thompson? that's why, you know, uncharacteristically, you know, I've been remained t terribly silent over the issue of, of Thompson because I've seen so many totally innocent people burnt. And I want to make the point, and I make it in the book, that Tins wasn't innocent. I mean, those four ministers went to jail, they were totally innocent. I mean, <laughs> it's not a crime to use your, your company car for private purposes or your government car for private purposes. Every, every government in Australia immediately moved to pass regulations that said you could use your car for private purposes, because everybody was doing it. But, you know, when the witch burning starts, watch out. And, I mean, I don't know whether Thompson's innocent or guilty, but the last thing in the world is for the parliament to become a judge and jury. That's, that's just terrible if that can occur. And if the media, who are owned by only two or three people in Australia, if they decide that they can burn you and the parliament runs scared, well, you know, we're in a terrible sort of situation. Um, so, I mean, it's very relevant, the question. Uh, it's a very good question in that, uh, in that sense. But, um, but the history of Theodore and the history of, um, not me, but Paul Keating said his two heroes were J.T. Lang and Ted Theodore. Um, <clears throat> Malcolm Fraser said his two heroes were... Franklin Roosevelt and Ted Theodore, and I've got Ted Theodore sitting on my wall. You couldn't get three more unlike people. But you know, uh, do we admire the man? Of course we do. He sacrificed his political life to try and protect this country from the Great Depression. Um, if he had been naughty, well, I mean, compare that to sacrificing your entire life and his money too. He, he went out stony broke. Uh, he made a lot of money later on, but but he went out stony broke at the time. Um, compare that, but. He was totally innocent, um, and so was the jockey penance charges were laid against him. If you ask me, did these men um, favour people that backed them with money, uh, with generous donations? Yes, and every politician in Australia probably has done that. And I would say it is, it's worst in Australian history now that the big corporations giving money to the political parties is worse now than it has ever been in Australian history. OK, we'll take an mm. another question here. Could I, could I just ask Two a more. Quick, quick question, please, about the Foreign Investment Review Board? What is your assessment of its effectiveness, please, and should its functions be reviewed? Um, 17 years ago, I lived in a country where the six great mining co companies that owned 82 per cent of our mineral wealth were all Australian-owned. Uh, our biggest employer in Queensland is still the sugar industry. All of our sugar mills in northern New South Wales and Queensland were all Australian owned, the sugar mills. All of the dairy factories, the great bulk of them are in Victoria, were all Australian owned. All of the con construction companies in Australia, the seven major construction companies, were all Australian owned. Um, all of our airlines in this country were all Australian owned. I mean, all of our airlines now are effectively foreign owned. All of our construction companies the seven majors are all foreign-owned. The six major mining companies are all foreign-owned. All of the sugar mills, bar three, 
are foreign owned. All of the dairy factories, with the exception of Murray Goulburn, all of them are foreign owned. You live in a country that is totally foreign owned. You are being reduced to serfs, some sort of modern day serf working for foreign landlords, and you will increasingly work for nothing in a deregulated labour market that will be deregulated by foreign workers being brought into this country to undermine our award and pay scales. And if I'm the only person in Australia saying that, I'll be saying it loud and clear until the day I'm going down in the box, I can tell you. OK, this is actually the last one. Here we go. Bob, just to, to cover up the same topic again, perhaps with a slightly different emphasis, how much time have you spent studying the climate science? Have you spoke to the chief scientists yep. in Australia? Have you, have you spoke to the CSIRO? Yep. Have you spoke to yep. the Department yep. of Meteorology? Yep. Where do you get your data from, if, you're, if you have a, a, a view that opposes theirs? No, I, I don't know where you got the idea that... No, well, let me say this to you, right? I do not believe there is any empirical evidence backing up global warming climate change. I do not believe there is any scientific knowledge that backs that up. Now, having said that, the scientists that I spoke to, and I spoke, I spent half my life with scientists, I can tell you, I'm that sort of person. I won the Science Prize for Australia for putting in the first standalone solar energy system in the world at the time, uh, in the Torres Straits. Um, so I know a lot about this issue. Um, but the, the same scientists that were telling me, Bob, the empirical evidence and the scientific evidence is just simply not there. But the same scientists said, but there is a problem in the oceans. So I cast around and found the leading, one of the 12 leading scientists in the world on carbon effects in the ocean is in Australia, Katrina Fabricius. She migrated from Germany because she wanted to go into this field and we were the world leaders at that stage. So I, after six months, I eventually got half a day with Katrina and the increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will go into the ocean. It'll make it less alkaline, more acidic if you like, but less alkaline. Shellfish will not be able to form their shells. And at the bottom of the food chain, I thought shellfish were up the top. They're at the bottom, they're little tiny things you can't see. Most of the shellfish are so small you can't see them. They're the bottom of the food chain. They can't form their shells, so the bottom of the food chain will start to evaporate and, um, and that will have colossal repercussions for the world. So no, I've never been against carbon dioxide, you know, lowering it and holding it back. And I have been the great advocate of ethanol. And Al Gore said the first uh, move that needs to be made to lower carbon dioxide is ethanol. And I've been the great champion. If you saw me when I, just before I came in, I had a telephone in my ear. I was speaking to Dick Arnott on ethanol as I walked in tonight. Um, so whilst I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't see the empirical or scientific evidence, I'm quite happy to look further, but I've spoken to hundreds of scientists on. Um, but, but in the oceans, there is a problem, yes. And, uh, and I think there has to be a bit of a pullback. And really, that's not a great problem for Australia, because we can sh our sugar mills can produce electricity. They don't. They burn the sugar cane fibre to get rid of it. They don't burn it to produce electricity. We can produce maybe 10% of Australia's entire electricity from our sugar mills, which is, it goes up, the next year the sugar cane pulls it back down again. It goes back up again, you know, ethanol's burnt, your petrol tanks goes up in the air, and, and your electricity gets burnt, and it pulls it down, it just goes up and down. There's no net growth in the sky. But actually, with cane ethanol, it actually reduces the amount of CO2 up there. OK, Bob, we have With to... grain uh, ethanol, it goes up and down. We're just about out of time, but I do want to uh, talk about... Um, in, in your book, and it really struck me as interesting, an illustration of how Australia has changed for the better over 100 years. There are two photographs in the Civic uh, Club in Charters Towers. One has been hanging there since 1899. Tell us about that one. Yeah. Um, in 1899, you recall I said one in 31 of us were sent down to our deaths. And there are all the Civic Club members, you know, in this exclusive club. And they're all sitting there in bowler hats and three-piece suits, like I'm doctored up tonight in a three-piece suit, mainly because my shirt hasn't been on. <laughs> and they're fob pockets. And they sent us down to our death in the mines. That was the situation in 1899. And I got them to take a photograph of the mine managers, the mine managers, in 1999, we were a big 
gold mining area again in 1999 and there were 12 or 15 of them and they were there in their work boots and jeans and khaki shirts just like the workers. There's no difference mm. between the manager now and the workers. Um, and that just is a towering achievement for our country. We're the most egalitarian nation on earth. Um, we're an incredible race of people. We really are. I think that's where we finish it, Bob. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>